G'day all, welcome to another Chook. Uh, today we're going to look in a bit more detail at arrays. So the first thing that we'll go through is just some syntaxes that I forgot to mention about single dimensional arrays, but then we're going to look at uh, 2D arrays. Alrighty, so some syntaxes for 1D arrays. You can actually set the initial values of, a, of an array, something like this, uh, int ARR5, and then the values separated by commas within uh, curly braces. So the 0 just here will be ARR0, and the 4 just here will be set as ARR1, the 3 will be ARR2, etc, etc, etc. Yeah, so you can just have a look through there if you want some uh, different ways of setting the initial values of a 1D array. Okay, so in the real world that we live in, uh, many things aren't in 1D. Uh, we live in a three-dimensional world. Um, but also there's uh, a lot of things that can be sort of thought of as two dimensions. So, for instance, a game's map might be a grid with X and Y. And it would be perfect if we stored this in a 2D array in RAM instead of using a 1D array. Because there's two dimensions, X and Y. So it's just a, a convenience, really. So the syntax for a multi-dimensional array is something like this, usually. Um, int 2D array 3.2 defines a 3 by 2 2D array. So there's um, one way of thinking it about it would be an array of arrays. We've got um, three arrays, and each of the arrays is two elements long. And you can see that just here. So here's the three arrays just here. 3, 4 is one array, 5, 6 is another, and 8, 9 is another. Uh, alternatively, if you want to set all of the initial values to zero uh, of a 2D array, you can nest these curly braces. So open curly brace, open curly brace, zero, close curly brace, cu close curly brace. Uh, that's going to set every element of this 2D array to zero. Uh, you can zero out even more dimensions if you want, so something like this into maps, and then I've got a five-dimensional array. Uh, you can just nest more curly braces and put a zero. Uh, you can't put sort of five there. Uh, it's not going to set every element to five. It's only useful for setting uh, the initial values to zero. Yeah, alternatively, if you want, you can also leave out the first dimension. So C++ is clever enough to count that there's two here. It's going to say, um, yeah, there's... 2 by 3 floats. Alrighty, so the syntax of a multi-dimensional array. The very first thing we say is the data type, and then we say the name of the array, and after that we specify the initial values. Oh, sorry, we specify the size of the um, dimensions and the initial values. So the size of the dimensions for this particular array is 4 by 3, which means that there's uh, four little arrays inside it, and each of those is three elements long. Yeah, so if you want to figure out exactly how much RAM an array is going to take, all you've got to do is multiply each of the dimensions by each other, and then multiply that by the data type size. So right here, integers are four bytes long, and my array is 4 by 3 integers. So, yeah, that's going to take up 48 bytes of RAM. Okay, these outer curly braces define the values of the array j dot dot dot. So if we think about, you know, j as just being a single dimensional array, it's got four elements in it. And each of those elements we're sort of setting up just as a normal... Uh, 1D array, so int j4 equals some value, some value, some value, some value. But the thing about a multi-dimensional array is that each of these some values is a three, uh, three integer long array of its own. Yeah, so you can see why they call it an array of arrays. We've just got basically four little arrays of three integers each, and we're calling the whole thing j. It's pretty confusing, but, um, yeah, an array of arrays is a good way to think about it. Okay, so this is one depiction of what this particular array might look like in RAM. Um, yeah, it's just a box with four rows and three columns, and each box is containing an integer. So, the way that I've drawn it just here, 
um, we've got four rows, one, two, three, four, and we've got three columns, one, two, three. Um, do remember that computers count from zero, so the four rows will actually count, you know, zero, one, two, three, and the three columns will actually be zero, one, two. Okay, that's good. So to get an element or to read the value of an element, you just supply the index. So there's two values that you need to supply the index of a 2D array. Uh, this first one, the way that I've drawn this array here, this first one is the row number and the second one is the column number. So if we see out the element at J32, uh, well, the row number is 3, so that's this bottom row down here, and the column number is 2, so that's the right-hand column just here. And the 11 is in the box that coincides with both of those coordinates. So this is actually going to print out 11. Uh, also, if you want to write to a value, a particular element of a 2D array, once again, you specify two coordinates, uh, 1, 0, for example. And 1 would be the row number, the way that I've drawn it here. So that would be this one here in blue. And 0 is the column number, so that's in red. I think I drew them the other way. Yeah, I did. I switched the colors for some strange reason. Anyway, um, J10 equals 99 is going to end up setting that box just there to 99. Alrighty, so things are about to get a little strange, but I think it's really important to realize that the orientation is completely up to the programmer. Uh, this array just here can be pictured as being on its side or rotated 90 degrees left, uh, as I've drawn here in this right-hand diagram. Uh, it's just a 4 by 3 box of integers. It doesn't matter what direction it's pointing in. And sometimes um, sometimes it helps to picture it pointing in a particular direction. So the very first way that I drew it, um, this mirrors the way that we talk about matrices, rows, then columns. And it's also exactly the same as the definition of the elements in the array. So 0, 1, 2 was the top line, all the way down to 9, 10, 11, which is the bottom line. But this second way here that I've drawn it is the way that we read maps and grids of, um, what would you say, graphs? Yeah, graphs or charts. Uh, we usually use X then Y, and X specifies how far left or right, and Y specifies how far up or down. So the thing to realize is that both of these are exactly the same thing. Um... Yeah, 0, 1, 2 could mean this, 0, 1, 2. And 3, 4, 5 is the second um, column. Uh, 6, 7, 8 is the third column. And 9, 10, 11 is the fourth column. So they're exactly the same thing. Uh, if we have a look at, for instance, J2, 1, uh, it's got 7 in both of these diagrams. It doesn't matter if you specify it being on its side or upside down or back to front. Um, J21 has a 7, no matter which way you draw the array out. Okay, so things are going to get even more strange because I've drawn a third uh, orientation down here and I've colored each of these boxes here to show that they're exactly the same thing. Uh, we're actually about to step through an example where I've drawn the array as this third orientation. And it's the same as a spreadsheet, this one. Yeah, if you think about a spreadsheet, if you've ever used Microsoft Excel or OpenOffice Calc, um, you specify the X first with a letter, sort of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then you specify the Y. So something like A0 or A1 would be this top box just here. And A2 would be below it. And B1 would be beside that. So this way just here is really convenient if you're trying to think about something like a spreadsheet. Um, I usually pr prefer to sort of think about arrays this way. But it is up to you, and different circumstances will, you know, be best thought of as dif different uh, orientations. And probably the only thing I suggest is that if you're having trouble picturing the array or manipulating the values in the array, um, draw it out. Yeah, label the X and Y in your uh, array definition and draw out a grid with uh, X and Y marked on their axis 
and probably specify where 0, 1, 2, 3 is. And uh, you should be fine. I mean, it looks confusing, and it is initially, but if you practice a bit, you'll find that it's pretty easy. Okay, so iterating through a 2D array. This is really the crux of it. I mean, there's no point in defining a 2D array if we can't run through the items in it. And to do this, you nest for loops. You put a for loop inside the body of another for loop. Uh, this is confusing stuff. It's really confusing. 2D arrays or 3D, 4D arrays, they're not easy. But um, hopefully, hopefully this will help. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you nest, so long as they're counting up to the proper dimension sizes. Yeah, we'll see exactly that in a minute. Okay, so let's just have a, a really close look at exactly how you would uh, run through a 2D array and set the elements. So the idea of this little example is just to declare a 4x3 2D array and then set all of the elements to zero. Okay, so the very first line that runs is going to create this 4x3 2D array, and I've drawn it out here. Uh, I've drawn that third orientation that we looked at, where the box 0, 0 is up in the top left corner. So this is exactly the same way that both a spreadsheet works, where A1 is the top left corner, and it's also exactly the same way that the pixels on a screen on the computer work. So the, the top pixel is 0, 0. That's right up here. That's 0, 0. And beside that is 0, 1. Um, yeah, all the way down here to, you know, whatever the final pixel is. Might be sort of 799 by, um, what's it, 6, 639 or something. Yeah. Anyway, uh, this mirrors the coordinates of a spreadsheet application, so I'm not trying to confuse the matter by flipping the array around. I think it's really important that you picture the orientation however you want. Okay, so after we've declared the array, the next thing that happens is that the y for loop starts, and this is going to invent the variable y, int y equals zero. It's going to set it to zero. Exactly like that. So this loop's closing brace is actually the last line, and this particular loop is going to count 0, 1, 2. Yeah, because I've said while y is less than 3, y plus plus. Okay, so the next thing that's going to happen, um, inside the body of the y loop is another for loop. And this is the x for loop. I'm using the variable x here. Uh, this is going to create the variable x and set it to 0. So for int x equals 0, is going to set the variable x to 0. Okay, then the body of the x for loop will run, which has got some array x y equals zero. Well, uh, x is zero, and y is zero, and we're setting the value to zero, so that's going to end up with this very first top left box being set to zero. Easy as that. Uh, next, the x will increment, and it's going to check if x is less than four. Well, x at that point will be one. That's definitely less than four. So the body of the x for loop will run again. Uh, y hasn't changed, but x has been incremented to 1. So the box 0, 1, or well, sorry, 1, 0, will be set to um, 0, which is this one here, the way that I've drawn it. And then x will increment again. It'll become 2. And the box 2, 0, will be set to 0. Uh, finally, uh, x will be incremented one more time, and the box 3, 0 will be set to 0. So we're just stepping through the array, going uh, horizontally, and setting each value to 0. Um, after that, uh, x will actually be incremented to 4. And once again, because of the, f the for loops uh, condition just here, it's going to check if x is less than 4, and 4. 4 is definitely not less than 4, you know, it's equal to 4, so the for loops condition is going to fail. Which means that control will drop back to the um, y for loop. And at this point, uh, x will have disappeared. x doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. So x only existed inside the body of that for loop, and that for loop's finished, so x is gone. Uh, we've effectively set the top row of our array to 0. Anyway, y is going to be incremented now to 1, and then the entire x for loop will run again. 
So this time x is going to count from 0 to 3 exactly the same as before, but y is going to be 1. So what's going to happen is we're going to set 0, 1 to um, 0, then 1, 1 to 0, then 2, 1 to 0, then 3, 1 to 0. So x is just going to count up again with y being 1 this time. And the effect of that is that the second row is going to be set to 0. Uh, after that's run through and the second row is set to 0, y is going to be incremented again. It's going to become 2. Then the y's uh, for loop condition will be checked. It's going to say, is y less than 3? Well, 2 is definitely less than 3. And the x for loop is going to run again. This time, y is 2. So 0, 2 is going to be set to 0. Uh, 1, 2 is going to be set to 0, 2, 2, and then 3, 2 is going to be set to 0. And after that, the whole array will become 0. Okay, yeah, so the important thing about iterating through uh, a 2D array is um, just that your two for loops count up to their dimensions properly. So you can actually put the x for loop on the outside and the y for loop on the inside. Uh, you know, nest the y for loop. But you've just got to make sure that they're both counting up to the proper dimension size. So right here, um, my array is 4 by 3. And if x counts to 4 and y counts to 3, and I've put the two variables, you know, exactly the same as the array's definition or declaration, uh, it doesn't matter which one I nest. Yeah, x is counting to 4, and that dimension size is 4. Y is counting to 3, and that dimension size is 3, so, you know, sum array x, y equals 0, is going to set the whole thing to 0. Uh, the interesting thing about setting it out this way, or nesting the y for loop, is that we set the columns first. So before, when we nested the x for loop, we set row by row, but this time we're setting column by column. Yeah. So the only important thing is that you count up to the proper dimension sizes. Doesn't matter which one you nest, all good. Alrighty, so before we go, I just want to mention that the reality of a multi-dimensional array is that um, it's just a convenience. Uh, RAM only actually has one dimension. You know, to specify any box in RAM, you need a single number, that address. Uh, that's one dimension. It's just a great big line of um, bytes, one after another. So multi-dimensional arrays, including 2D arrays, are just a convenient trick and the computer is multiplying and adding the coordinates that we give them. Yeah, so it's pretending there's a 2D array with its 1D addresses and it'll, you know, quite happily pretend that there's a 3D array or a 4D, 5D, 6D. Uh, it'll pretend that there's any sized, you know, dimensional array with its 1D addresses. Uh, it makes things really convenient, especially when you're looking at sort of, you know, 3 or 4D arrays. But this is basically what's happening. Um, so these two here are exactly the same thing. Uh, this left one here, I've used the 2D array syntax to set element 2, 3 to 49. And this right-hand one, I've declared an array of exactly the same size. Uh, 5 multiplied by 7 integers is the same as just saying, you know, int a double r 35. And to set a particular value, 2, 3, for example, we could do something like uh, a double r 2 multiplied by 7 plus 3. So 7 is the size of this second dimension just here. Now, these two things will actually end up setting exactly the same box in RAM to 49. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's about the end. Um, I just want to say that if you find that a bit confusing, especially the orientation stuff, uh, just practice and sort of realize that although there are wrong ways to deal with 2D arrays, there's also an awful lot of correct ways to deal with it. And it just takes a bit of practice uh, before you realize that... Um, you know, these, these 2D arrays are just boxes pointing in any direction you like, and so long as it's clear in your head uh, what you're trying to depict or what you're trying to manipulate, um, you can think about a 2D array in, in just about any way you want. 
Um, yeah, just don't write outside the bounds of it or you'll be in trouble. In trouble by Windows. Windows will crash you. Okay, well, that's about all I wanted to say, so thank you for listening. See ya.